Broadcasting from the commodity capital of the world, Zurich, Switzerland, this is Insider's Guide to Energy. This addition to Insider's Guide to Energy is brought to you by Fidectus. Go to www.fidectus.com for more information. Welcome to Insider's Guide to Energy. I'm your host, Chris Sass, and with me is co-host Johan Oberg. Johan, how's it going? I'm all right, Chris. Another week, another episode. Really looking forward to this, and especially also after the last couple of weeks and all the attention we've seen about the show, around the show, on on social media. It's, it's really encouraging, and uh, therefore even better now when we have something really interesting to, to show off today. Yeah, I'm excited about today's show. Um, I just got back from a live broadcast we hadn't done. We went out and met our fans. We went to the ETOT conference, part of the Energy Trading Week in London this week. Uh, a number of our show team were there with me. So there, we got to be in the audience. We actually uh, hosted uh, a panel session, or I did, hosted a conversation with just like a show, except it was live on stage. And we actually recorded an episode that will come out the, the week before this. So if you're listening to this, you probably already heard the episode. Uh, but it would be a live show from the trade show. So that was kind of a new thing for Insider's Guide to Energy to be doing a live show. It was a little bit of different logistics for us. No, and I, I'm so gutted that I couldn't be part of it. I was I was really wanting to go up to, to, to London. It's, it's, you know, as you know, it's my second home. I lived there for, for, for quite a few years, and, and especially now as well when it's been all over the news, some uh, even energy-related. I spoke to a few friends. No, of it's, it's, it's not even gas. energy related. The, you know, <laughs> no, everything. You land at the airport and I'm like, well, should I take an Uber or a cab? Because are they going to have gas? Because if, yeah. if you if you look at the news, the world's basically ended in the UK. Uh, when you get to the UK, it hasn't ended. But you know, every, everything I watch in the news, I, I was reading a story yesterday how they're not going to have enough chocolate for the shelves before Christmas because of supply chain issues. But um, yeah. At the energy trading conference, uh, certainly the gas markets and our, our current guests could probably talk a little bit about that. Uh, it certainly has impacted things in our industry, and it, it's certainly a, a rough patch for many, depending on how you placed your bets. Uh, some some of my customers are faring better than other of my customers in, in yep. the current environment, at least in gas. Um, and then in petrol, there we passed a lot of gas stations that were closed and had huge lines over there. So it reminded me of the U.S. in the 70s. Mm. Where, where they had gas shortages and, and there were lines to buy gas. Um, there they, in the U.S., they end up rationing even in odd days. I, I think they're still figuring out what's going to go on in, in the U.K. because it seemed like there was still shortage of gas when I was there. Yeah, no, no, it's, I just seen it on the news. I'm gl- glad to get some reports from the front line. So uh, interesting. So but let's talk about our show. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I think we've got uh, an interesting show coming up. We're excited. There, there, there's, there's elements of the show that please you. Because I know you like to talk about entrepreneurs, entrepreneurship and entrepreneurialism. And, and our current guest has, has started a company. She comes from a trading background, so she knows trading. And she's trying to solve some problems. And she's done it and spun out where she's also got the ability to, to make a difference and, and do some things that are green as well. So you, you have a trader that's saying, hey, if you're going to do trading, you need to have the kind of transparency to do what you think you're doing. But I'm going to let her explain what all that means. But I'm really excited to have this show. Likewise. And I think, as you mentioned, I'm always interested in the entrepreneurship and, and the way they approach it. And, and today's show, I think, I hope, this is my, my, my kind of objective, my, my kind of looking forward to the show. And it ticks so many boxes. We talked about sustainability, a hot topic. Uh, I just came off a CMO conference during the week, a virtual one that was the big topic. Second part, as you mentioned, entrepreneurship. But equally as important, you know, we've had a lot of entrepreneurs on the show, but usually they come from the outside of the industry trying to break into the industry. Here's someone that is actually from the industry and seeing opportunities to do this. So that's also something I, I'm looking forward to hearing a little bit more from and, and looking into. But um, uh, really looking forward to this. Well, let's just dive in. Let me introduce our guest today. We are proud to have with us Melissa Lindsay. Melissa, welcome to the program. 
Hi guys, thanks ever so much for having me on your show. I actually was at ETOT this week. I um, was speaking on the LNG day about LNG digitalization um, and obviously ah. talked in about carbon on that. So it's a shame I missed you. But yeah, it was nice. Yeah, I think we said we were going to meet and you, you probably weren't at my panels then. Oh, that, that hurts. <laughs> I, I'm terrible at conferences. I only ever sit in mine, and then as soon as I'm finished, I like to go to the pub. Um, but it was good to actually see so many people there and have traders actually, you know, in a room together and to be able to discuss the markets. And it's interesting you talk about gas. So in England, we call it gasoline, and obviously, um, gas is the natural gas in our systems, and we're running out of both over here. But you know, a large part of that is being exacerbated by people panicking. And, you know, earlier when COVID started, you know, people started panicking about toilet paper then. So <laughs> the shelves were empty of toilet paper and people queuing up for it. So the English just, you know, they're renowned for liking to queue. So we're happy to queue for petrol, it seems, too. Yeah, I definitely saw cars lined up. I went by some BP stations or whatever in my Uber on the way to the conference. And there were certainly long lines out onto the motorway waiting to get petrol, as you would say. So the issue is, there's not actually a shortage. Like up north, it's fine. It's just down south. I think people have enough time to sit in these queues and they're very packed and people are topping up. So you see that people are, you know, getting out the cars and then they're only there for a couple of minutes because they're just topping up. Whenever they see petrol now in a station, they're feeling like, oh, while it's there, we may as well get it. So yeah, people are going a lot more frequently and yeah, keeping their tanks as full as possible. Um, as opposed to being out of it. Well, since this is hopefully going to be history by the time we air this show, because we're about a week and a half away from airing the show, so hopefully it gets solved or or, or or they fix some of these issues. And if not, we'll talk about it again in a couple of weeks. Um, let's talk a little bit about yourself. So maybe a little background. What's the name of your company and what do you do? Um, so I've actually got two companies. Um, one's called MStream and the other's called MSurge. And it was largely because I had the idea to build a broking platform for LNG when I was at um, Tullet Prebon. So I was the global head of LNG broking at Tullet Prebon for a um, decade. Um, and during that time, my client base went from seven companies to over 150 companies. Because LNG tends to trade in teams, I had over six, 700 people, front office staff, that you know i was having to cover in the market so it made sense to me to have a centralized online place where the traders could post what they wanted to buy and sell and those orders would be instantly disseminated to the whole market um Tullet Preben asked me if i could design something that would work for any bespoke commodity so i did that and then it was about a year to try and get funding internally because of MIFID 2 and because of um, the integration, TP, Tullet Prebon bought ICAP. So the merged company took precedent. And so all of our IT resource was tied up on that and on MIFID 2. So at the end of the year, um, I was incredibly frustrated and they saw that I wanted to set something up myself. I had said kind of a hundred times, you know, why can't I just remortgage my house and I'll just pay for it myself then? Um, and yeah, they finally basically let me do that and said, look, if you want, you can leave, you can find yourself a lawyer, spin out a tech company, give us equity in exchange for your ideas. And then anything else can be in a separate company. So Mstream was the first company. And then knowing that the .com and the .co.uk was unavailable and I needing a company name and a website within a day, I went on to GoDaddy and I put Mstream into GoDaddy, knowing it was taken to see what it would suggest. And it basically said msurge.com. So I Googled surge and the definition was something that has previously moved at a slow rate. And I thought, you know what, <laughs> that sums it up nicely. So that's why we've got both. That's pretty cool. It's, it's kind of fun to, to have two entities. Uh, I, I could feel the frustration when things go slow when the the mothership or when you when you start uh, with a large organization, it doesn't go at the pace of uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, as, as someone that's done a number of startups and is in a young fintech right now, um, it, 
you, you move at a pace that very few that are established businesses can keep up with, right? Because that that's the whole beauty of a startup is 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 weeks are like years in a real company. Yeah, so <laughs> I kind of um, felt that given it had taken a whole year to get the funding approved for you know the initial build, I realized by then that I would need to keep going back for more money if I wanted to expand or add new products. That it would be easier to fund in the long run by spinning it out and having it separate. And it actually worked out quite well because where I have this second company, I was able to be my own foundation customer. So where if you're trying to sell enterprise level solutions to the big inter-dealer brokers, um, they're very stringent on you know the quality of that software and then also the licensing agreement. And they try and put as much risk as possible onto the vendor. So by being my own foundation customer, I'm not putting any risk onto my tech company if, you know, if the system was to go down. And I think everybody in tech smiled when WhatsApp and Facebook went down for so long because it was like, great, you know, even these big organizations go down too, but it's very hard to have, you know, zero bugs in software. So before, before Johan jumps in and wants some mic time here, um, what exactly does your solution do? What, what, what's the value creation? So you, you created some intellectual property based on your experience. So what'd you create? So it's really a platform that can create a marketplace for global bespoke commodities. So in the past, people tried to standardize commodities to fit them on a screen to make it easy to trade. But in my view, technology was so flexible now that you don't have to standardize a product in order to be able to put it on a platform. And so we now have um, an online marketplace. It initially was for liquefied natural gas. So we're now at a stage where we've got 40 energy companies around the world on the platform that whenever a trader, like recently we've had someone this week um, posting an order, they're looking to sell a cargo into Northwest Europe. They put that on the platform and instantly all 100 traders on the platform receive an email notification to say there's a cargo available. Whereas the majority of trades today, you know, if the UK wanted to buy an additional cargo of gas, you're talking about phoning up all the energy companies around the world and negotiating. So it's very cumbersome. And by the time you phoned everyone, you know, the first opportunities and the first people you spoke to, those first orders are probably stale. Um, and then LNG, in the last couple of years, people have been, you know, doing an increasing amount of carbon neutral LNG trades. They're, in reality, these aren't neutral. These are carbon offset cargoes, and it's not necessarily the full life cycle either, which it ideally should be. Um, and so because people are looking to team natural gas with offsets, and largely these are nature-based solutions, um, to deliver kind of low, lower carbon energy to people and for gas to have a lower footprint and, and to be part of the energy transition. So just going back a little bit, Melissa, when, when you came up with this idea, you worked through it in your, in your, your role uh, within your former company. Uh, you, you thought the technology can solve this. Uh, there's two questions. One, I'm slightly surprised that this was the case, that you actually phoned around, <laughs> which which was, uh, I thought was a brilliant thing, uh, example. So, so solving that with a very basic technology, well, uh, such a big step, I thought it was good. But going to the other customers, you know, here you come uh, with your new starting company, coming out to the, all the utilities and say, hey, you know what? I have a solution that you haven't thought around or can actually make this better. What was the response? Uh, from from uh, from the other traders or from the other companies, or the initial one at least. I spoke about my platform to everyone for over a year to a point where if I said the word platform, I was made to do a shot. And all the traders though gave feedback along the way. And we, you know, our sales tagline has been designed by traders for traders. You know, we invited the traders to UX. Um, design workshops with, you know, what I consider to be the best UX designer in London, um, a guy called Martin, and he was absolutely fantastic. Um, and, you know, we sat down and said, what is your, you know, 
what is a trade life cycle? What is your workflow? And what are your pain points? And when we dissected it, people really said that their pain points were all the internal communications um, ahead of a trade and after a trade. The trading itself and the speaking to people in the market and the closing the deal, people enjoyed doing. And, and that was the easy bit. And so our view was that we would create technology that catered for really the pre-trade. So in the same way that if you're buying a house, you're gonna use the internet to search for what types of houses are available and you've got your criteria, like which part of the world or which part of the country you want that house in, what style um, and what budget. The same is for LNG in the sense that you can post your interest but at the end of the day, I mean, at today's prices, these are $120 million for just one cargo. And you often trade these in strips. So you'll trade one cargo every other month for three years or something like this. And so the deal value is so high, you're never going to just click and trade something like that. So we wanted to focus on the parts of the trade lifecycle that we felt could be digitalized as opposed to doing what I think most people do and going after that point of transaction. Um, and also, you know, everyone or all the textbooks always talk about this um, five to seven year value of death for tech startups. So, and you know, it's why you often see people go through all these multiple funding rounds to get through that value of death. And my view was like, well, how do I avoid getting stuck in that value of death? And my view was that if I can create a product which has value to just one customer, but is designed for net, uh, network effects, then I can hopefully make enough revenue to sustain that period until I build a critical mass of users and functionality for the platform to then take off and gain traction. And, you know, so far it feels like it's working. We're still, you know, um, in our first friends and family round. So my friends happen to be LNG traders, which is quite handy. So, you know, I have over 10 LNG traders and desk heads in my cap table um, and then some other consultants and some technologists and, and everyone's basically strategic that I have in there, which is, you know, for me, that's great. So, so I, I, I get the funding angle of that. That's obviously important. You have no business without getting your arms around that. You, you talked a little bit about the problem statement. You said, hey, rather than going where where it might seem intuitive to go, where we're going to go is where the problem is and where we can bring value. And perhaps that was the communication or the research before one of these deals, I think is what I heard you say. Is that correct? Yeah. That so right? we, um, we wanted to be a structured data capture tool. So, you know, at the moment, a lot of the um, really good data is being lost because it's in emails and WhatsApp chats or phone calls. And so we thought that if we can create a structured database, um, then there's a lot of value in that data and you can then also sell the data. So you, you can sell data from the system, you can sell software as a service, and then you can also look to try and get transaction fees where you broker some trades and you do some introductions via the network that's on the system. So there's multiple revenue streams and um, that's possible from our business now. And so I think in our previous conversations, I, I recall you saying you had you had a number of customers and a number I've seen on your slides at a different point or a number of brands I'd probably recognize, at least in the, in the gas markets or LNG market, right? Um, how is, is it the same problem statement with your second company or second effort? So if you're, you've got carbon as well as one of your so carbon considerations? Added, um, so initially, we've literally added carbon as a tab. So okay. we've recycled a lot of the design from LNG. And the thing is the design packages that you can use to build software are much better now. So where it took, you know, it took a year to design and, and it cost, I think I spent 170,000 pounds on designs in total. Um, actually a bit more for a graphic designer as well to kind of add some lipstick to it um, for the LNG platform. For the carbon, because we can now use something, it's another software package called Figma, where it's basically Sketch and InVision in one. You can design much faster in it. So we've been able to spend, I would say less than 5,000 designing the carbon screens, though it's taken me a year to get my head around the carbon market and understand what are the fields and how does it trade? You know, uh, what are people quoting when they're asking to buy or sell carbon? 
Um, I joined the Mark Carney-led task force for scaling voluntary carbon markets in January. Um, and that's been an amazing process. And really, our carbon platform was answering the call in their first consultation document for greater transparency in the OTC brokered voluntary carbon offset market. Um, and we've designed with alignment to the, um, the work and the research that has come out of the task force. So going back a little bit to this, I, I, I find it really fascinating and I love the story of regarding as a marketeer in terms of listening to the customer and actually co-develop with the customer, which in your case were the traders, uh, which I thought was really, really interesting. So creating the first platform with input for, from your trading friends, did you have the same approach also for the carbon part or was that more copy paste of the former one? Or was there still an inter kind of interaction defining where the key point pain points were? So, yeah, I, I think I've got this unique insight because I'm broking LNG as well. So even though I've got the tech company, I'm still actively broking cargoes of LNG and I'm using and testing my own UX and my own design so I can work out. So because people were asking for carbon neutral LNG, I started thinking about what is the additional fields or, you know, digitalization challenges that LNG traders will have when they need to start factoring in the carbon price or the carbon content that, you know, the greenhouse gas emissions intensity of these cargoes. And so where I started to explore into it, so with LNG and energy, there's two big things. You need to really understand what the emissions are in the cargo itself. And then if you plan on offsetting it, you need to use quality offsets. So you need to understand what a quality carbon offset is. And so because companies like BP, ENI, Catagas, they're much better placed than I am to understand and to work out a robust methodology for calculating the emissions in the cargoes, I focused on what is a quality offset um, and hoping to you know, bring that understanding to the LNG traders to help them source quality offsets. And with LNG, we're talking 250,000 tonnes of carbon per cargo on average. And so the entire LNG market represented about 1.3 gigatons of carbon last year. So it's a huge volume. And already in the last couple of weeks, you've really seen the, the spot market of nature-based solutions and you know reasonable quality offsets completely dry up. Like the the energy companies are really going big on this, and they're building portfolios. Um, and at the moment, again, it's like LNG where you're phoning around all the projects around the world. But with with carbon, the market is even more highly proliferated. So there's over four thousand active projects. There's nineteen thousand planned projects. Um, and so it's a minefield for people. And so we're actually much more excited about our solution for the carbon markets because people want transparency in carbon. Whereas with um, LNG, the oil majors have been getting away with for decades saying, you know, we like it opaque. We like the inefficiencies in the gas market because that's how we make money. And, you know, and I think um, this whole movement towards really, really fighting climate change will hopefully change things and be an accelerator for the adoption of um, greater digitalization in commodity trading. So you're obviously not the only one that sees an opportunity to provide transparency. So are there other schemes or people trying to do it differently than, than your approach that you agree with or disagree with or how their other approaches are? So in LNG, there was another platform called GLX. Um, they've taken the decision to allow people to share orders via their system to select counterparties. So we basically believe that if you do that, yes, it can build fast attraction on your software, but you create dark pools. You know, you actually are using software to enable the market to continue to be very opaque if you allow people to selectively show numbers to certain people. And certainly the traders which are supporting my platform agree with the philosophy that this should be a more transparent marketplace. And they say the reason they're supporting me is because everything shared is shared to everybody in the market and not just select participants. Um, and then on the carbon side, you've got 
<laughs> well, so many people want platforms. I hear about a new platform for the carbo market um, almost daily. Yesterday I heard of that Microsoft and Rabo Bank are planning to launch something in January. You've seen Temasek and Standard Chartered, um, DNB, um, and another institution I can't think of right now launch um, Climate Impact Exchange, CIX in Singapore. You've got Air Carbon Exchange, which is a blockchain based exchange also in Singapore. And you've got CBL Expansive, which is the one which is probably gaining the most momentum. It's been around um, one of the longest. So also CTX. So they were originally, I think, the same team. And then they split into two different competing companies. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot going on. I would say what we're doing, which is unique, is um, we can be used as an internal whiteboard system. So a company can take our system and just use it to database and organize their information internally and share with a team. And Carbon is like LNG, where you have a global team of originators, all speaking to multiple different participants, and then having to centralize that information internally and share it. So we're, we're addressing that challenge. And then we're also um, looking at enabling people to post interest to buy or sell um, further out. So people can say, we want to buy a million tons of offsets from the least developed country. We want it to be a removal or a nature-based solution for the next five, 10 or 20 years. Um, and they can say, you know, we're looking for offsets in the price range of seven to ten dollars or they can go and even say we you know we're looking for offsets from nigeria and we would like to you know have a request for quote and publish that um and projects which are looking for financing we've also got the ability that if you're looking for investment then you can post on there and the other thing that we're really pleased about is you know i think the hydrocarbon trade is coming into the market it's more about quality of the offsets because they're under so much scrutiny than it is about what's the marketing pictures that are going to come with these offsets. And so you're seeing a lot of tech companies emerge. We like Sylvia in particular. It's another UK tech startup. They're using satellite imagery, machine learning, LIDAR radars to go on the ground and assess the permanence, the additionality and the leakage to come up with like a quality rating of these projects. Um, and there's quite a few different technology startups all emerging in that space. So I think, you know, everything's moving in the right direction. The introduction of tech can only accelerate the journey for the carbon market, which is exciting too. So just an interesting question, just, just thought around it here. So, so there's tons of platforms. I remember being in the, the IoT business and I was in kind of, I remember flying back from Barcelona, Mobile World Congress, and I said to my colleague, if anyone mentioned the word IoT platform one more time, I'm going to hit them because I was so tired of platforms. But one of the things that I'm just curious about, when you address the, the different tradings, uh, the, the different traders, because you, you, can, you can have a software that you can deploy company-wide, or you can have a software that is used by individual traders. How, how does this work? So how, how, how do you, because it, it's speed and, and then maybe the largest companies are not fast. So how, how does this actually, call it the sales approach, uh, work? So I think the idea is that with a bespoke commodity, the hardest thing is your data entry form. And having, we've got a really slick UX um, on ours where you can enter all the details. So when it comes to carbon, you can enter what standard it is, what, um, so in terms of like Vera or gold standard, you can enter whether it's a removals or avoidance offset, whether it's a nature-based offset or not, um, which country it is, whether that's the least developed country, which of the sustainable development goals and other additional attributes come with that. So all of this information, which is unique to every single order we're capturing, and because that is the most difficult part to get right, then whether you're doing that to internally capture data um, about your counterparties or whether you're doing that to enter an order and share it with a broker, it's the same. So we, we just see it as being a really efficient way and you know recycling as much of what we're building as possible. Even when I was at Talib Prebon, my view was that 
we should give the platform to all the other brokers. Um, but in LNG, I was the only, and kind of am still the only broker that's been able to successfully, um, on a regular basis, close LNG deals. And so for that reason, there wasn't all of these other brokers to sell the platform to. So as a broker, because you're competing with internal origination teams, and so if I say to a trader, you know, I've got a cargo available in Spain, then they often say to me, oh, we need to check what our team is seeing and see if it's the best price against what our internal originators are seeing. So my view is that it would make sense and they can respond to me faster if all that data was in one place. Um, and on the carbon side, it's exciting because the carbon desk is having to cover um, requirements from every single product desk. So the oil guys or you know the bunker team or the LNG team or the gas trading team, all of these products are seeing demand and interest from their customers for carbon neutral products. And so the relaying of the requirement for offsets needs a way of being centralized and shared. And you know, you've got so many more people which are exposed to the carbon price. And actually every single corporate is. And I think, you know, at the moment, people aren't seeing the fact that prices um are particular to the vintage, which is the year in which the emission savings or avoidance or removal took place. Um, and so the older the vintage, the cheaper the offset from the same project, rightly or wrongly, but this is, uh, this is how the market is trading. Um, and so we kind of see also that the more you buy, so unlike other commodities, the more carbon you buy, if you can buy more than a million tons per annum, you start getting a discount on the price. And so those nuances aren't reflected in current platforms and systems. And we've built something that can cater for all of that. So where is the information all these fields come from? How, I mean, how do you guarantee the quality of the information going in there? So I, I hear all the cool attributes that, that would be good for the decision tree or to understand. So where is that populated from? So because it either a trader can enter an order and share it by the platform via my broking company. So I've got visibility of who's behind the bids and offers. Um, their post is as anonymous to everyone else on the system. Um, because all of their colleagues and team can see what they're showing to the market, we're finding that people are actually less flaky and more firm on their numbers and the opportunities when it's being shared on the platform because you do have that digital record of what's happened and their company has visibility of it. Whereas when someone's just phoning you or speaking, you know, people do pretend to have cargoes they don't have just to try and get information and an understanding of who's in the market to buy. So, but, but I, I guess, how do you get, how do you assure the accuracy of the offset information or like if, if, if a broker can enter it, right, even if there's a record of it later, how, how are you getting the fields to, to guarantee that they are what they are? So, I mean, I've been broking LNG for over a decade. I've been broking, mm -hmm. you know, offsets now for six months, but if you make things up, you don't have any longativity in the market, you know, and in our T's and C's in the small print, we've got the right to pull anyone we suspect of, you know, manipulative behavior, but, we just haven't seen anyone wanting to do that, to be honest. Um, I think everyone's so highly regulated in the energy markets that, yeah, it's not an issue that we see at the moment. Yeah. Do you want to ask a question? In regards to, I, I just want to go back a little bit. We talked about what the platform did and, and, and the, the opportunities you have moving forward and, 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 the kind of the double thing. But if I, if we move back a few years ago, you're sitting in your own former job, which is, I wouldn't say a secure job because it's a trading job, it's a high pressure job, but how, how was it just to say, you know what, I'm going to leave this now. I've been here decades, 10 years. Uh, I'm going to do this on my own. Was it, was it a simple step? You worked on the platform for quite some time. So you obviously believed in the technology behind it, but how, how was it? Was it a big step or was it a natural step? I think it was definitely time in the sense that, you know, I had been saying to my management, I'm not broking unless you give me my platform. 
And then my boss said to me, what do you mean you're not broking? That's what we pay you to do. And I was like, you know what, good point. And he was like, why can't you do it? You've been doing it for 10 years without technology. And my view was like, yeah, but the market has grown. And if we want to keep pace, and the market basically with LNG, and this is why we've got a shortage of gas. You know, my dad was asking me just now, you know, why is it taking so long to bring on more supply? The financial investment decision on a liquefaction facility can take five to 10 years for them to put that project together, to find the buyers, to find the financiers, to source the gas, um, to do everything that's needed to get all the permitting. And so because of that lead time, it's not easy, but it means that you've got visibility. So, you know, you're able to say all of these projects are coming on stream that the LNG market, I think it was going at the time from like 217 uh, million tons per annum the year I left. And it was forecast to be 350 million tons per annum. You know, it's still growing. Um, you know, they're forecasting or people are saying that the energy market needs to double um, in the next decade if we are to reach next zero. And if we are to be pragmatic and say that we must be using gas to push out coal, and, you know, and especially in, in Asia. Um, and we've seen the Europeans basically say that, you know, we don't want um, gas beyond 2030. So for the last couple of years, you've seen hardly any new supply projects reach FID. And this is why we're in the situation we're in, in my view at the moment. So, yeah. so I get I get that point. And I guess maybe a little off track here. So have you seen kind of on, on a more of a policy side, have you seen how the LNG markets maybe reacted to like Nord Stream 2 talks between EU and the US? And is, is that impacting any of, of your business? Are you seeing that in what you're doing? Um, I, I don't know if you saw the other day, there was um, a, an engineer accidentally put test data through suggesting that the gas was flowing and the market dumped like 10, 15 percent. And, you know, and the fact is, Europe did have a lot of LNG scheduled to it. You know, even now I'm being offered a cargo, which would be a diversion out of Northwest Europe because our market is so flexible. So the thing is, people secure cargoes on like a medium or a long term into Europe and they see it as a backstop. And because Europe has the gas, then people are able to divert these cargoes to China or Brazil or anywhere they want as soon as somebody's willing to pay a higher price. And what we saw this year was, and again, because of climate change and the weather patterns changing, the hydro facilities in Brazil and China weren't able to produce enough energy that it increased their demand for gas. And so people simply haven't been able to fill up the storage ahead of winter. Um, last year, um, the prices ended up spiking up to $40. And it was probably only a couple of tra cargoes that traded at these high prices. But where the prices hit $40 per MBTU last year for um, gas in Asia, it's meant that people see that as, you know, where things could go again this year is very believable. So what people are willing to pay as a kind of risk premium and an in, in insurance against that is a lot higher this year than previous years. So you're really seeing in the same way the British have been panicking about petrol. You know, people have been panicking about energy and in a lot of other countries, you're talking about state-owned utilities who it's their responsibility and the government mandate to supply energy to the people at all costs. And so... Well, the yeah. problem is it's not at all costs. It's, it, it's the sale price to the people. Part of the problem is is a defined cost. Right? Well, they so can't change their... The, so the, the, the supply can go up, but their sale price can't change, right? Yeah, no. So there's a lot of them have these adjustment mechanisms where then... In the preceding six months, the price is higher. So they are able to pass through the cost. And if you think about it, you know, the headlines are hit on, um, you know, the spot cargoes, which are trading up at, you know, $30, $30, $40. But for a company, say, Kogas or these big buyers in Asia, the majority of their supply, like 70 plus percent, might be for long term contracts, which could be at lower prices. So you're talking about an average price. And the majority of cargoes could well be at cheaper prices than the ones being paid. But, you know, it's very, very hard to say who the winners and losers are in this game. 
because a lot of people hedge. And so a lot of people that you think might be making money right now might not be because they hedged at much lower levels. Which, which is obviously a, an interesting component around the whole ecosystem of, uh, of energy. But looking forward then, uh, you, you had the, the, um, the, the initial platform on the LNG, then you had the carbon. What, 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 do, you see, what do you see the rest of the opportunity? Uh, you're a platform provider, you're a technology company. Uh, where, where do you see growth? Uh, is it in other commodities? Is it, it, it expanding the, the energy trading? Or where, where do you oh. see opportunities? So I, I think we haven't had our hockey stick moment in LNG. Um, you know, we're, we're adding a few users now every week. Throughout COVID, you know, it, we had that challenge in that all the traders were sent home. And so their IT departments were obviously having to focus on the, the basic systems to enable people to work from home. And where we were trying to sell enterprise level software, we just weren't able to get the attention that we needed. So my view was that I would just give free trials to everyone. I would slow down the development to reduce my cost. And I was the only person on kind of sales and marketing and product for a year. So it's just me and my dev team. Um, at the beginning of this year, I had um, a girl join me in London and in Singapore. And so we've got much better coverage and the ability to increase the rate at which we're marketing this product and getting traders on board. You know, we're kind of reached that critical mass now where, you know, once you've got everyone on it, everyone else wants to be on it. Um, the LNG customers that we have form this amazing demand basis uh, and starting point for carbon. So, you know, we've just had to go around and ask, you know, who's your carbon trader? Who's responsible in your company for carbon? And for a lot of these companies, it's super new. Like, they're only just figuring out whose responsibility carbon will sit with but it's definitely going in the direction. So I think there's huge growth in the carbon side of things. And then we've been asked to add hydrogen. We've been asked, you know, someone else has said, you know, it'd be really great in um, plastic and water. So anything bespoke, you know, I really like the whole ESG component products. And I think you're going to start to see commodities trading with everything, methane certificates, um, responsibly sourced gas certificates, greenhouse gas emission certificates, and then the offsets. So I think the certification of many things, you know, there'll be, there'll be a need for platforms for that too. We're talking about biodiversity offsets too now as well. So yeah, I think huge potential. So I'm excited because of the passion that is going through as you're talking. And, and since this is a podcast, our audience doesn't see the expression in your face, but there's clearly passion throughout this, this entire conversation. And that's interesting to me. I, I, I'd love to know, um, so you've been doing this for a bit of time. So what's your favorite part about what you're doing? Um, I think it's definitely getting to work with my friends. So, you know, I've got an amazing team of people around me. And actually, that was the hardest thing about leaving Talit Prebon. I had built an amazing team of really nice people there. And, you know, the team that I've got now, you know, my best friend works for me. My brother's always been techie. I've never understood what he's done before, but, you know, he's been helping me from this. And, you know, my brother's made it a lot less scary to go and do this because he works at a software development house and um, he's been hugely supportive and involved. Um, I had a new CTO join earlier this year and he's absolutely incredible and he's taking over a lot of stuff for me. So, yeah, getting to give people jobs they love and, you know, everyone who works for me, like a Amy in Singapore wanting to work part-time and have better work-life balance, and so I just feel like I've got a really happy team around me and being able to give people the kind of work that they want to do. Um, and I think we're going to make a really positive difference as well. You know, I went into LNG broking because the market was so inefficient. And I really believe in resource allocation efficiency. And to me, there's huge wastage in the energy industry. Um, and now the carbon stuff is gaining traction. You know, it's brilliant. I did international development at university and because I really believed in, you know, the fact that the West should do more to help developing nations, especially when we're the cause of a lot of problems that they have. Um, and I think that the carbon market provides a huge opportunity for the redistribution of wealth and really helping the people who are the most vulnerable to climate change um, 
um, yeah, yeah, and be protected and um, from from that. Well, it, 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 I, I I can appreciate the team. I still see the passion through everything. I I, I love that, Johan. We're, we're running up towards the end of the show here. I, I want to give you a chance to ask any final questions or final thoughts that you might have. I think some final thoughts. I I I. I second you Chris there in terms of passion I we've had a lot, a lot of guests on the show and and you really see the ones that are driving their own that they have a passion there's a glow around them and I think this is something we saw I think this is also a necessity in terms of you need to change something you need to have that extra so I, I Melissa I thought that was really really interesting a lot of these things I'm not an expert in but I learned a lot from it so I thought that was uh, extremely interesting. I've always been a little bit suspicious when it comes to regarding this uh, sustainability and the offsetting, if it's real or if it's greenwashing or not. But if, I think that came across really, really good. And I'm glad you finished off with that as well, because I think this is where we're heading. And if we don't believe in it, our, the customers who are buying the stuff are. So I think that was really, really good uh, um, uh, final part. If I can say one final comment. Absolutely. Yeah. Sure. People Absolutely. talk about sustainability a lot. And I think, um, and you know, it's one of my best friends who's been, um, you know, into sustainability for a long time, who said that, you know, actually we shouldn't be aiming for sustainability. It should be really regenerative business practice. And I think we've gotten to a point now where, you know, we can't actually sustain the way things are. We have to do better than that. And I think people should be looking at regeneration and not doing things which are, just sustainable and we should be going over and above. I think that's a fantastic <laughs> wrap up of that one. I'm sorry, I'm going to steal that from you. I'm going to start using it. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think um, I want to ask one last question. So a lot of exciting things happening. You've got a, a early indicators that you've got good customer market and good traction. Where are you guys in five years from now? What are you doing? Um, um, well, hopefully we'll have a liquid trading platform and I won't be having to broker manually as well as running the tech. You know, the dream is really that the tech people engage with it rather than having to have this hybrid model of people and technology at the moment. Um, so yeah, and you know, it would be really nice to see that the voluntary carbon market reaches its objectives of you know, scaling five times in the next five years um, and, and of that market being of a high quality. And so it has a real meaningful impact. And I think this is one of the things that gets missed sometimes that the quality of offsets aren't always sufficiently high to have the impact um, on climate change that we need to see. Um, well, cool. I appreciate that. I, I... I hope that we see everything. I, I got buzzed out during your answer. Unfortunately, my, my internet dropped part of the answer. So I'm going to trust that my audience can or tell me what they said, as well as uh, my co-host. Uh, any response? Because I, I, I don't want to have a fair response, Johan. No, I thought that was good. I, 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 as I said, I think it was uh, really, really interesting. I think you know, the, the whole not tying up the knot at the end uh, regarding this I thought was really really interesting uh, I really appreciate you coming on um, I think this is uh, such a broad area so I'm still trying to fit you know put my finger somewhere on where the focus should be we covered a lot of different things uh, during this uh, show and I think there's plenty of areas that we could do more deep dives in but I think this was really really interesting well I thank you for being our guest on the show. Um, I, I, I hope it goes where you do. I look forward to talking to you in the future. I look forward to actually seeing you at ETOT and some of these other conferences where we actually see each other when we're in the same room. Uh, thank you very much for being on. Thank you ever so much for having me on your show. It's been really nice. And thanks for the opportunity to um, yeah, promote what we're doing. Well, you're very welcome. And to our audience, uh, as I always say, you spent another hour listening to Insider's Guide to Energy. We're excited to have you here. We hope you enjoyed the content as much as we did. And if you do, remember to share it with your friends. And don't forget to subscribe to us where you get your podcasts. And certainly go to our, our LinkedIn channel and, and follow us there because you will get the latest information on Insider's Guide to Energy every single day. Thank you. Mm -hmm.